Welcome everyone. My name is Giulia Melidoni and I'm the president of GRLA. Thank you for choosing to be here with us today. We're delighted to welcome Silvio Campera, Global Chief Executive Officer for Golden Goose, Brandy Reed, in Sortizen from the Houston Lab, along with her moderator, Andrew Rosenov, senior in the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. In September 2018, Silvio Campera was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the Venice-based label Golden Goose tasked with further accelerating the brand's international growth and continuing his track record of boosting revenue and improving margins. Campera, a graduate of the prestigious Università Commerciale Luigi Bocconi, began his career in 2004, working in Alexander McQueen and moving to Giorgio Armani in 2006, contributing to the launch of the brand's retail network in Asia. In 2009, he specialized in buyout operations, starting a long and fruitful collaboration with Style Capital, which sees him as a protagonist of Sundex retail expansion before becoming an investor and commercial director in Golden Goose from 2013. With the entry of Permira and the remaining of Campara CEO, Golden Goose's growth objective as a global luxury player has been strengthened. In the course of Campara's management, the brand has reached a turnover of over 263 million euros in 2020. Brandy Reed, started her golden journey in November 2020 as an in-store artisan for the Houston Lab, the first lab in the United States. Reed has been an integral part of the Golden Goose team, traveling throughout the US and South America, training new and aspiring artisans. Andrew Rosenov is a senior in the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, majoring in science, technology, and international affairs, and minoring in computer science. He's also the captain of the tennis varsity team. Golden Goose, an Italian fashion sneaker brand, was the creation of two young Venetian designers, Francesco Rinaldo and Alessandro Gallo, who were both outsiders of the fashion industry at the beginning. Founded in 2000 in Venice, Italy, the brand combines a refined and modern style with a vintage feeling that is supported by the strong Italian sartorial tradition. Before we begin, I will pass the microphone to Francesca, who will provide some event guidelines. Hello everyone, my name is Francesca and I'm the Vice President of GRLA. Before I pass it on to Silvio, Brandy and Andrew, we would like to provide you with some event guidelines. Please make sure to keep your mask on at all times throughout the event. Our conversation with Silvio and Brandy will run for around 30 minutes, followed by a 20 minute Q&A. On behalf of GRLA, we would like to thank Silvio and Brandy for taking the time to be here and sharing their invaluable experiences with us the entire Golden Goose team who's here today. Professor Ernst and Wilbur Ildego from the Global Business Initiative, Dean Grant and Maria Anderson from the undergraduate office, and the dedicated members of GRLA for helping us put this event together. Now please welcome to the stage our moderator Andrew Rosenov and our guest speakers Silvio Campera and Brandy Reed. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Again, on just behalf of GRLA and everybody here, thank you guys for being here. Grazie. Um, we got the opportunity to speak a little bit before about the history of Golden Goose. And as Julia so greatly introduced, started as a small Venetian brand in 2000. And you came into the picture in 2018. But Silvio, it sounds like you really resonate with what the brand is about. And we talked about it being purpose driven. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit more to the history behind Golden Goose and what you think makes it such a unique brand. First of all, uh, thank you everyone for being here. As you can imagine, it's always a honor uh, to attend uh, these kind of moments because of the energy, because of the possibility that you are giving to us to give back. Because I was sitting at your place 25 years ago, unfortunately. Because uh, <laughs> I wish it could be there, even though I'm happy or where I am. Uh, but, um, what you said, you know, is very uh, touching me uh, because Golden Goose, uh, we always say uh, it enables in every one of us our inner star, no? And uh, the little secrets I was willing to disclose to you before uh, under our work, it was uh, exactly that, no? So uh, most of you probably know our product. Uh, you have been uh, giving your, your sense uh, to our brand, because technically the brand never take taken a, a position in imposing a, a point of view, you know, to all, all its lovers, you know, all over the world. And uh, 
But, but what I will start today is uh, trying to explain you and give you this insight of uh, why probably uh, Golden Goose is not a brand that you desire, but it's a brand that you love, uh, which makes Golden Goose different than any other brand in fashion, in my opinion. And uh, it positions Golden Goose more as, a, as an icon rather than a hype. No? And um, it is really a combination of, of elements. So it is uh, the spiritual elements uh, that is linked to the star, because uh, remember that I didn't invent it, I didn't create a golden goose, I simply had the honor to scale it, because the company was 17 million when uh, uh, I enjoyed, and uh, today is uh, definitely more than what they said before, but I don't know, Georgina, can I, can I disclose something or not? Okay, not yet. Anyway, much, much bigger, much bigger. But said that, you know, what is the most important? From 17, 17, 1, 7 employees to 1,000 employees, okay? In the, in the 10 years I've been uh, uh, running this project and leading this project. But at the beginning, Alessandro Francesca, that created this in 2000, they were, they are my age, so they were 20 years old, and it was a, a, an era that it was dominated by brands. They were setting a uniform. So you were the Prada guy, you were the Dolce Gabbana guy, the Giorgio Armani guy, the Gucci guy, but there was no space for individuality. There was no space to define yourself, you know? And again, 20, 23 years ago, I'm telling you about a word that now it sounds you very modern, but it was 23 years ago. And basically, for Alessandra Francesca, the star was representing exactly that themselves, but not in the sense of Hollywood, in the sense of I could be the aspirational element of that, no? I could be an individual, and every individual is a star, you know? You don't have to be part of a community. You don't have to dress a uniform to be someone. You can define yourself. So there was a lot of inclusivity. There was a lot of uh, expressing yourself or being unique on this probably very famous concept of Golden Goose of perfect imperfection. Because every one of us is uh, living the entire life in finding the best part of him or her. That's why the star is cut. Because we always think that it creates more empathy, a symbol that is not perfect, rather than a symbol that is perfect. Because otherwise, it cuts all the aspirational element of you. And again, when a product can synthesize what you stand for as a person, probably I would say that these two guys, without knowing it, as most of the innovation in Italy, because you have to know that Italy is, uh, is the country of instinct, not of planning, okay? They created something unique. So uh, now we can talk about uh, moving from product to purpose, but this was happening 20 years ago. So these guys were really doing something, first of all, for their soul, and then, you know, for the product for itself. And that's why, in general, Golden Goose is, first of all, something you have to stand for rather than something that you have to own. This is how I will describe. And basically, you know, my job it was simply to do not dilute this message, you know, even despite the, the signs. Yeah, it's amazing to hear how deep the roots are from a purpose perspective and some of the spiritual and philosophical elements that you were talking about the brand. Brandy, for you, the opportunity to be an artisan, to help out with co-creation. I know you only joined in November 2020, but what does the star mean for you and what does this opportunity mean to be able to go and impart your own individual creativity on the shoes that people bring to you? Yeah, so I feel like, um, you know, it's really rare to find um, a company that is extremely passionate and does everything just based off of love. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why I, I love my job and I love Golden so much is because, um, you know, there's so much emotion translated throughout all of our products. Um, and being able to customize or co-create our products, um, it allows that emotion that is originally felt when we handcraft our sneakers or handcraft, you know, the majority of our products. Um, it allows that to be translated all the way down into our stores. Um, and I, I love the fact that I get to, to be a part of that 
every day and, and um, you know, translate our emotions and um, our love and passion, you know, and then also the clients. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think, you know, Sylvia, you talked about the international expansion and how much the business has scaled in the past few years. And it'd be great to get both of your guys' perspective on how you think about the design process. The superstar, the superstar silhouette, so famous, so iconic. And moving forward, as we continue to iterate on designs, how do you guys think about that as the business continues to scale and continues to grow, both from the perspective of the CEO and from a creator? Great question. And uh, I mean, even just hearing your question, you know, it's always a movie, you know, in a, uh, comes like, you know, a huge emotion on my eyes, on my, on my, my heart, because really, uh, and Sylvia was, was together with me, because, huh? uh, you know, she was on the other side, because she was one of the first buyer uh, buying Golden Goose, and uh, I was on the other side. And uh, try to imagine, the company I found in 2013, uh, it was majority ready to wear. Golden Goose was 60% ready to wear. And uh, by 40%, it was uh, shoes, not even sneakers. Because remember that the first island that made Golden Goose famous in America were boots, Texan boots. So technically, sneakers were 36% of the revenues of 70 million. So basically, after meeting Alessandro, Francesca, you know they were already solding the majority you know, of the company that I was entering also as investor. You know, we really had to sit down because I'm a very focused person. I'm a very driven person because I love to, I love the human side of, of, of my job, but then, you know, I have also to touch the ground, you know, because you have people investing and you have to, you know, uh, create value then, no? And uh, so I said to Alessandro, listen, I don't believe that we should focus on the entire product proposition. First rule is to have a clear view of who you want to be. And uh, the fact that I've been always, uh, if you ask what is my specialty, is consumer. I'm really obsessed by consumer. And what I was thinking it was very elementary. What is it missing in the closet of the people? Basically, wear sneakers. Because back in those days, you know, every one of us was simply having a pair of Nike, Adidas, or Puma, or Reebok, but no one was having something a little bit more elevated. And uh, without knowing this, we created a huge revolution in uh, every one of your habits. If you think, guys, before Golden Goose, before 2013, every one of you, while defining their outfit every day, they were always starting from top to down. Today, when, you know, the night before or in the morning, you define your outfit, you start from the shoes and then you go to top. So Golden Goose was definitely a big part of this crazy evolution on the costume of the people. And this was reflected by the sales. Because remember that Golden Goose then is still the only handmade sneakers in the world. Everyone is doing sneakers. Uh, you know, to make a pair of any other luxury sneakers, it takes like 40 minutes. To make a pair of Golden Goose more than four hours and a half. Remember that Everything is then made. That's why then, when you use them, they become more and more beautiful because of the material we choose and uh, because of the way we really con we construct the shoe. It's made in order to stress the movements, the natural movements of your feet in walking. In this way, it's like I was, as I was telling you before, it, it, you know, I, I usually say that I love to imagine that our, our customers and our lovers uh, compare Golden Goose where they are most beloved pair of Levi's 501, you know, because uh, this is what you would never leave. Why? Because as Brandy was saying, there are memories in there. This is what made Golden Goose timeless and an icon. The last mile is always made with your emotions. It's not made by us. And that's why also on the communication side, the internationalization of the company was, a, I think, with a miracle, no, Sylvia? Because, uh, guys, let's be frank. How could you imagine to be the $150 million business in the U.S. without spending $1 in marketing? Impossible. 
honestly, impossible. But the perfect combination of a current product with our philosophy, meeting people that were in love with the product, you were in the end our marketing. So we are probably one of the best examples of word of mouth I ever experienced in my entire career, honestly. And uh, uh, then how can we keep on scale? As I was telling you before, we simply have to be to respect uh, uh, all the people that are loving the brand and ourselves uh, by nurturing this uh, um, conversation between uh, the brand and uh, the people. So powerful to hear you talk about the emotional side of what we wear, because I think too often times we just put on a pair of clothes and that's what I'm wearing for today. And we don't think about sometimes the memories that are associated with the shoes that we wear. Um, so it's very powerful to hear you speak about that. Um, and just moving on and thinking, you spoke a lot about the consumer and having the consumer forefront of mind and that being one of your strengths. And I think across the world, we're seeing a generational shift in terms of maybe the types of consumers and types of demographics that are looking at Golden Goose, but also, especially with the pandemic, a huge shift to online and to e-commerce. And I know that the in-store experience is a huge part of what you do, Brandy. And I was just wondering, again, from your perspective, how that might have changed from a creative point of view in terms of what's going on in the Houston lab and how you guys are still able to interact with customers on a personal level, even if maybe foot traffic is going up or if it's going down. And then from, again, an executive's point of view, how does that shape where Golden Goose goes moving forward? Yeah, I think it's interesting um, that you mentioned how, you know, there has been a huge shift in um, the way that we shop and the way that we consume products today. Um, I studied interior design in school and a lot of um, research was showing that retail was kind of dying. Um, so it was really interesting to get out of school and then see a brand like this that is being able to um, kind of thrive in this, this environment um, that's not necessarily shaped, you know, for um, in-store activity. Um, and I think one of the reasons why, you know, we've been so successful in this is by, you know, providing this in-store experience that is unique. It's, um, exper it's, it's providing an experience um, to people where you shop online and you have no real um, connection to your product because you're just buying it, you know, from online. But when you come into one of our stores, you know, you get to learn about the journey. You get to see, you know, specifically in the Houston lab, we have the tumblers in the front that demonstrate how we distress our sneakers in Italy. We have sneakers hanging from the ceiling. We really make it this interactive um, experience for our clients, um, which, you know, makes them want to consume more and makes them want to express themselves through our product. And I think that that's one of the things that we've really succeeded in, you know, from a business standpoint. Um. May I add, uh, you're so right. Uh, the also numbers are, are saying, not confirming what Brandy is saying. Uh, can you imagine, just to, to touch the ground, 70% of the, profi the profilations of new customers in Golden Goose are still happening uh, offline, 70%. While online, it's like, it seems that our customers acquired offline are then buying com cons compulsively online, exactly. So uh, just to remark and highlight what you were saying, experience is still a super important element of the Golden Goose uh, philosophy and their relation with the, with the customers. Why? I mean, look at Brandy. I mean, uh, you, 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 she's, not, she's not someone selling something. She's someone telling you something and sharing something with you, you know. Yeah, it sounds like that shared experience with the customer in store is again so powerful. Um, and then Silvio, I, your leadership philosophy is also fascinating. Um, and the way you approach both the artistic and design process side, but then also being able to focus on the business. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit more to that leadership philosophy. I think being the chief executive of a retail and luxury brand is very unique in the world, and it requires a very different 
set of skills compared to a lot of other chief executives. Um, and so if you could speak maybe to your approach when you first started, how that's been shaped through your experience at Golden Goose, um, and maybe the couple of things that for any future chief execs of luxury and retail um, companies out there in the crowd, if you could maybe give a couple pointers on the couple things you find the most important to what you do. So in Italy we say that uh, you cannot uh, sing your song, okay? So, uh, Silvia, please, can, can you say how I am? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, of course, uh, this was not planned. So that's Silvio. <laughs> so it's a surprise every single day. So it's, a, it's just a way of uh, don't uh, impose, really, but it's a way of uh, inspiring, uh, in a, sometimes in a very random, random way, and, uh, but it's uh, exactly what leads to creativity. So for me... Um, I've been knowing Silvio, Silvio for many years now, and uh, I, what can I say? It's very, it, it's a privilege for sure, and uh, I'm very lucky as well as as well as all of our teams to have the opportunity to express ourselves and our leadership through our own way of being. So it's exactly what we just described through product, but also with, with our people and our teams is exactly connected. So it's all, all like a, a circle between like, uh, uh, from the suppliers to our vendors, to our customers, to our teams, uh, creating uh, emotional connection between them through empathy, through kindness, and through respect. So, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I, um, I really do appreciate like about my job too is that, you know, how many times can, can someone say that they have a relationship with the CEO of their company and I work in store? So it is really amazing, you know, the connections and the family that we have, like, with each other, so. So if I may add, uh, just to try describing you the, the perfect recipe uh, that, of course, then as all different individuals, uh, assume different shades, is that simply always before, uh, after this graduation, after this, this school uh, time, the suggestion I can give you that was really uh, driving my entire career um, and then defining also my style, it was to really believe in yourself and to really don't be scared about what you are. Sylvia said correctly, it was strange, let me say, a little bit sfigato. Uh, I don't know, how can I translate it, sfigato? Uh, Georgina, you are the best on this. Uh, eh? A little loser, yeah. Because fashion w was always matched with uh, snob, arrogant, uh, trendy, na na. Well, for me, I was a happy guy. I was doing Boy Scout, I was playing basketball, I was loving school, I was loving music, I was a normal person, you know? And I was like, is there a space for a normal person in the fashion community? And, you know, on this, yes, I was really driven and no area of compromise. I'm never changing myself. And I was like, if I have really to deal with this industry, I don't want to change even one millimeter of myself. And this, this coherence with myself then became my trademark. And that's why today I am what I am. It was not planned. And the best suggestion I can give to all of you is, is a huge exercise, huh? because it deserves a great connection of the three main elements of every human being. Brain, heart, and instinct. This is what you have to do all along your university or school life. Exams, 20%. The 80% is enjoying life, enjoying really relations. Because through the other people, you really could have the ability to better know yourself. You said correctly. It was really inspiring, Yara, what you said. 
what was exactly the sentence? It was beautiful. Yeah, you're never the smartest, the smartest in the room, a bellissima, no? So this was the funny, my study is, I never, because it's all about, of course, a team and you, I never hire anyone. I always choose, okay, and I found, I discover people. This is what I like. This is your urgency to be meaningful, not to be the best, believe me. Because today, it's not about product, it's about consumers. And if, and uh, the ability that every one of us has is to be one million people along the same day, you know? You could be one person in the morning, one person in the afternoon, another five person at night, and this can change every single day. In, yeah, this is the complexity of being a human being. Because today, you have too many inputs. You know, back in the days, you are white collar. You are Gordon Gecko. You know, are you going to born and die Gordon Gecko? Today, no. Today, the, the society and, 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 um, and um, the culture in general is going into be yourself. And if you're really honest, you cannot be one thing. So exercise on this. On be really connected with you. Because if you are connected with you, then your ability in recognizing the customers outside will come naturally and your, any of your business will be successful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's touching the ground. Uh, it's, it's becoming numbers, so it's not like a, a, up in the air. Huh? When we study a product, you were asking me about the product, and you? We never start from leather, design, this. No, never. Guys, 70% of the marketing spend in the company today is on performance marketing, so digital, okay? So try to imagine, back in four or five years ago, you were simply, you know, allocating like 10 million and then spreading out, you know, like, you know, let, let me link, you know, my shoe uh, to Gucci, to this, to that, you know, to your benchmark. Nowadays, it's over. Nowadays, we, we approach to performance marketing in a completely different way. So you know how it works? For example, we, see, we just launched our, our sustainable sneakers, okay? We never thought about how much sustainable should be. That was obvious. But we were thinking, who should be the person on the other side? And even the way we approach to the marketing side of it, you know, we, we, don't, we don't link the shoe with another brand. We don't associate with brand. We associate with moments. We associate with uh, uh, other other institutions and other moments that are related to our to these to these people. I give you an example. I mean, I'm, I assume that a person that is uh, wearing a pair of Yatai, our new sneaker, is probably having a salad at uh, Sweet Greens, you know, or is uh, is uh, uh, I don't know studying at Georgetown University, or is. Uh, um, playing at the peloton, you know? So the, 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 this, this is the way, the modern way to plan collections, you know, and to plan items. Because these items has to be, you know, the perfect signature on memorable moments. This is the way to really find a place in the heart of our customers, not in their closet. Yeah, I want to maybe p pick up on that in the new sneaker collection and that sustainable line because I think that's something that has come to the fore in recent years and is becoming increasingly important for consumers to shop sustainably. And we always talk about within fashion, fast fashion, sustainable fashion, with a lot of other brands doing it. And so what does that look like for Golden Goose where everything is handmade, hand-stitched, where the materials are so selectively chosen and is that an aspect of the company that you're really excited about moving forward? And I will say that, but can I say everything, Georgina, or not? <laughs> not, not, uh, 100%. Uh, okay, yeah, but you have the mask, you know, this is... Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I will say because we are among friends. Um, no, what, what, what is, what, what's interesting is that this word sustainability to me was not enough. Sorry, but I mean, it's... Is so not golden, you know. Uh, you know, we have to be more ambitious than that. And, and you know, um, 
it was coming now from this beautiful uh, brainstorming that we had uh, internally, that we stand more for responsibility because it's including, it's including the angle of the, the future angle, uh, which is the sustainability, so innovation, you know, uh, alternative materials, uh, is a way, uh, you know, to, to show that we can improve, okay? But on the other side, what I think is so stupid, allow me to say, and, uh, and limited, is only to think about that angle. So what do we do? Who, who deal with the 98% of the rest of the goods that are with cow made with cow leather, with uh, uh, gold leather? So that was where really Golden Goose is going to make the revolution because it's also about giving long life to that product, you know? And Golden Goose, of course, you know, is a, by definition uh, coming from that zone because our, our product is then made, so it's uh, in respect of time. But then on the other side is also, who's gonna take care of my product? So we're gonna launch soon uh, this incredible project that's gonna be part of the forward agenda, including uh, the cobblers. So we're gonna offer the possibility to repair and to recycle and to remake uh, all the sneakers, not only Golden Goose, your Gucci pair, your Nike pair, you know, all the sneakers, you know, are around because, you know, it, it sounds stupid, but there's much more to do in there rather than just sustainability. So that's why I love this idea of responsibility because you have to, there's no, there's no a brilliant and bright future without a great respect of the past. This is what we think. This is really fascinating to me because you've spoken about responsibility authenticity, creating shared connections with the customers, and I think that's really unique. Um, and it's interesting because at least in, in my mind, oftentimes as a company scales or even as you rise up to different positions in a company, those things are lost oftentimes um, because it becomes overly professional and overly polished. And it was great to hear you talk about how Golden Goose is so horizontal and you, Brandy, how you can have a direct connection with the CEO when you work in store. And so... I want to understand, moving forward, how does Golden Goose look to nurture those really important core values to the companies? Because as, as we continue to grow going forward, um, I think it's important that those, those emotional connections and those values are maintained. Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously, like from the jump, like this is a personal sort of experience um, for me. When I was interviewing for the position, I interviewed with five people. The last was Sylvia, who's the CEO of the U.S. Um, and throughout all of my, my entire interview process, I could feel the passion, the, the love, and, and um, you know, I could really feel the energy that everyone in the, the company had for the love of Golden. Um, and it made me want to be a part of it even more. But I think that, you know, when it comes to the way that we hire now and the way that we communicate with all of our uh, employees and everyone that works, you know, around us, um, I think as long as we continue to translate um, this passion and we hire based off of that, like, it will never be lost, you know. Um, we all share the same interest and the same passion for what we're trying to do. So in reality, there should never be hierarchy in a, in a company just because, you know, you're all trying to achieve the same thing, no matter what the scale is, no matter if you're packaging up boxes or you're the CEO of a brand. So I think that that's, you know, one of the, the biggest things um, that made me want to, to be a part of this. Um, my career path has been very sporadic um, and I will say that I'm very lucky to have found such a, a good you know group of people um, and I would definitely recommend don't like not settling um, for a job like right after you get out of college just to have a job really try to find something that you love um, because it is out there and you will always find yourself in the right place at the right time with the right people around you as long as you're true to yourself as, as Silvio was saying. In Golden Goose, you wake up in the morning and you never think about the problems you have to solve but about the opportunities you can really deliver. This is what we do. Maybe 
just to turn, because we have a lot of young students in the audience, if you picture yourself back in your last year at Bocconi, you in your last year at LSU, aspiring to be in the fashion world or be in the interior design world, whatever it might be, what's maybe some advice or, or a goal that you had in mind as you were venturing out into the professional world? That yeah, this is uh, interesting because I just graduated last year, so I feel y'all. <laughs> um, but I would definitely say that I always looked at my career path as not like a linear thing. Um, I wanted to experience as much as I possibly could, and I think that that's one of the biggest things that I could, you know, suggest or give advice on, um, is to try to learn and experience as much as possible because life will give you all the answers. You just have to, you know, open yourself up to that and um, be available for new opportun opportunities. Um, so that would be my biggest advice, is to make sure that you're exploring every avenue that's possible. Um, because you never know. I mean, I thought I was gonna be getting my master's in architecture right now, but this this has turned into so much more. I never thought that I would be doing art um, and being a creative for for my job. So, you know, just, just follow your passions and, and stay true to yourself. That's the biggest number one. Something to add, you did amazing. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, we're gonna change our roles, huh? Or maybe, what were you thinking about in your last year at Bocconi? Did you ever imagine ending up? I know you started off in the fashion world at Alexander McQueen and then moving to Giorgio Armani, but is that you knew that you want? Was that your passion honestly, as branded? Honestly, you know, uh, okay. For one time, I will spend, uh, I will spend, uh, um, I want to be the biggest fan of my country. Okay, because I love to be uh, and to be and to be the biggest fan of the world. Okay, but on one thing, I really think that Italy is incredible. Because if God and goods happen, it's because of Italy. Uh, we have so many bad things. Okay, uh, I can give you like one uh, a list of one thousand negative things. But the incredible thing of Italy is that this ability of Italians in general, because it was not only Silvio, eh? they were the suppliers, they were uh, all my people, is this incredible ability of being multitasking. Remember that Italy has been always surviving and never planning, you know, after the Romans. So basically, depending on the ruler of the time, you know, Spanish, French, Arabs, I mean, there were so many, we are always good in surviving. So this, define this ability, this incredible ability of Italians of learning by doing. So if you ask me if Golden Goose was planned, no. If you ask me if uh, Luxottica was planned, no. If Montclair was planned, no. If Gucci was planned, no. Nothing was planned in Italy. Even, uh, even uh, David uh, of Michelangelo was not planned. Everything in Italy is an instinct of beauty. This is what Italy is. And it really gives me goosebumps because when, when you, probably every one of you uh, had the chance to come to Italy, when you walk down the streets in this in ordinated chaos, what in the end remains in your heart is beauty. You know, so for me, we are now the country of fashion, we are the country of beauty. And uh, if the only thing uh, I may recommend to all of you is uh, to do not underestimate the power of beauty. Because it sounds uh, very superficial, but it's not. There's a lot inside and uh, behind that. So it, again, there are all suggestions that are not quantitative, but believe me guys, you can synthesize in numbers every time. But where you can make the difference is always on the human side of, of the things. This is uh, the advice I can give. And thank you both for those words. Incredibly powerful. I just want to say thank you again on behalf of everybody, everybody here. We probably have some time for Q&A, right? Um, but let's just give a round of applause because that course. was fantastic to hear from you. Thank you so much, Silvio, Brandy, and Andrew for the very insightful session. To wrap up, we'll now move to our Q&A moment. If you want to ask a question, there are two microphones at the front of the stage. So we invite everyone to ask questions.
Otherwise, I will come to you. Huh? Uh, buongiorno, Silvio. Hi, Brandy. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Carlo. I'm a uh, senior studying finance in the uh, school business. And as a finance major, um, what really interests me is that um, multiple private equity firms have invested and taken over Golden Goose over your, your uh, time as a CEO. And I'm interested in how you manage those relationships with those private equity investors and balance the needs of the investors with the needs of the company. Thank you. Great question. Uh, and first of all, congratulations uh, for, for, for being here, and, uh, and thank you for the interest. Uh, so, um, yes, um, we were talking about this this morning, yes, Silvia? Incredible. Uh, I love life because, you know, top is then, you know. Uh, exactly, always come back. Uh, yeah, uh, did I invent anything in fashion? No. Um, am I a Superman? No, okay, but for sure, for sure, yes. On one thing, I really contributed seriously on defining a new, a new, a new job, okay? Uh, because technically, you know, I've been graduated in an uh, economical institution. Uh, substantially, I was uh, a fashion lover. But in the end, I became uh, um, the mix of the two. Um, so I've been able to, together with these incredible friends from uh, Style, Ergon Capital, Carlisle, and then, and then uh, uh, Permira, to define a new vocabulary. This is where I've been really great. If you ask me where we made the difference in, in my industry, it was here. Because honestly, if you, if you look around, who else? Who else? Nobody. Because all is caring, or is be a mage. But private equity and uh, the entrepreneur together so successfully creating value, mm, very few stories around. So what was the magic? And Sylvia was saying, respect, kindness, and passion. And then being always honest. Don't hide anything in the good and in the bad times. So try to put in their pants, you know, Permira invested 1.3 billion two weeks before COVID happened. So of course, you know, I was like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> now, you know, I was announced to be the largest deal, you know, on 2020. So then they're gonna, they're gonna announce me as the biggest fail of 2020. So it was complicated, but I'm a very optimistic person, and first of all, there was something tangible. Uh, I've been also very famous in my industry because I've been always reinvesting 100% of my proceeds. Okay? It was, was a tangible uh, sign of trust on my crew and, of course, on the project that we were setting up together. Second, um, I've been always very frank. I'm not Italian on this. Uh, I'm very Anglo-Saxon. So I, don't, I really don't go around, and I go straight to the point. And I, and, I, and I said to Permira, listen, did you buy a brand or an EBITDA? And they said a brand. Okay, so then listen to me and follow me. So at the end of the year, Golden Goose was the only brand, only, the only brand, without increasing one dollar of your shoes, okay? We never increase the price. In 2020, Golden Goose did the same revenues of 2018. By doing what? I cutted 40% of the orders, and uh, I completely focus and, uh, and, and, and believe on uh, the strength of our connection with the customers. And all our customers were incredibly shopping online. It was incredible. They were like supporting us. It was really touching. And, uh, this is just to give you a little example. Then Permira, you know, came back to me and they found the same EBITDA of 2018. And, you know, just for a matter of clarity for who maybe already forget, 2020, the EBITDA of 99% of the fashion brands were like minus 30%, just to be clear. And, allow me to say, we're not inventory. 
Because remember that every pair of golden goose that you buy is only in that moment because we never replenish. It's handmade, guys. So it's not, it's not a factory of repeating things, you know. Uh, it's a factory of dreams. So all these little elements, you know, consolidated the relation because in the end, you know, the financial institutions want to see records, good records. But if I may, there's also another element that I want to remark on their side. In the end of the year, we've been not only reaching the same revenues and the same EBITDA, we also did another thing. We paid all the MBOs. We didn't fire any person. We didn't decrease any salary. Why? I, I was saying this, this, this sentence to, to Andrew before. Remember that Italy is very different than, uh, and the Latin countries in general are very different than the Anglo-Saxon countries. We are based on family, not on teams. Teams are based on performance. Families are based on trust. And it's under the difficult times that you define the bar of the trust. So try to imagine all our people from America to China to Korea, uh, from all over the world, seeing their salaries always paid, despite you know, the situation. And remember that Italy was uh, the first country you know, heated by, by, by COVID. No matter what, we said, listen, we will do all our best to do not betray the trust of our people. And uh, that's the reason why then of all our results. And Permira was together with us. So it's interesting, just to answer your question even in deep, that fashion industry is evolving, but also financial institutions are evolving. So what, I'm, what, what I've been saying before on being yourself, on being kind, is meant to be also for finance. I mean, Wall for Wall Street, I mean, everyone watched the movie, okay? But believe me, it's not like that anymore. It's not like that anymore. Of course, there's a sense of success, everyone wants to succeed, but it's the way that is completely different. Why again? Because customers change. You are purpose-driven. How could be finance not current with you? So that's why I think we did great, but also Permira did great. So all the leaders of Permira and Kalai, you know, were really sensitive to me. And if I'm here, you know, guys, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't uh, auto voted and auto, you know, um, uh, exactly elected myself as a, as a leader of this organization. They did it. Remember that, uh, you know, I basically grew this company from scratches. And they appointed me then as a CEO that is so boring, so 90s, sorry to say, but. <laughs> CEO, come on, who want to be CEO today? Nobody. No, that's a very, that's a very important um, element. Listen, listen well, because I've been thinking quite, quite, quite a lot about this, and it could be inspiring you. I think there are times for managers and times for leaders. Under the times that, after the big revolutions, you need to increase to evolve. And so for that path, you need managers. But under times like the one we are living now, so uncertain, so fast, where revolutions really are happening, you need leaders. So people that are focusing on uh, the vision, not on the results. That's why my best wish to all of you is to be the best leaders, not the best managers. Because there are so many managers outside. But leaders is where you can make the difference. Thank you. Silvio. Amore. <laughs> um, what has been the most rewarding part for you in the whole like last year as you worked at Golden Goose? And what would you say was a major moment of the brand? Hmm. So the first part, the first part was hurt it? Rewarding. Rewarding. Yeah. These moments. Honestly, these moments. Because it's when you can give back that everything makes sense. This is what I feel. And uh, everyone that knows me knows that uh, I'm real when I'm saying this. Because it's all about that, you know. Why are we here, guys? To make millions? Yes, of course. You know, we have to pay back our <laughs> investors. But in the end... But in the end, what really stays 
is your, again, as we were saying before, all your memories, you know, and uh, believe me, um, at the beginning, of course, when, you, when I was your age, I was absolutely willing to make a lot of money. So don't follow every word and every sentence I'm, t I'm giving you because you have to shape your word because your word today is not my word. You are the future. I'm the past, by definition. So that's why uh, I, really, I really suggest to you especially, Yara, uh, and then to all of you, uh, to simply follow your path, okay? Because, again, whatever I can tell you is already old. But one thing I think is still sexy is um, don't size it. Let it flow. This is what I, I, I can suggest. Grazie, Yara. Um, thank you so much for being here. We are so grateful. Um, my question is, in the eyes of the consumer, Golden Goose has largely become known as a sneaker brand. To what extent do you embrace that perception and to what extent are you very much looking to expand um, your focus on other product lines? First of all, I'm very happy where I am. So uh, being perceived as a sneaker brand uh, is fantastic because uh, as I was saying to Andrew before, uh, we stay in the only place is keeping you touching the ground, okay? So your feet. And uh, it's where probably you produce 70% of your memories because you do by walking, by sitting, by running, you know? So we are very happy to be there. Then uh, there's, uh, there's, there's another great opportunity behind that, and I, and I really thank you for making this question. Do you, to this word of mouth, of course, most of the people uh, perceive Golden Goose a product. So the next path for, the, for, for, for Golden Goose in the next 10, 15, 20, 50, 80 years, it will be to consolidate it uh, as, a, as, a, as a brand. So passing from a global business or global product into a global brand. And how can this happen? Simply by nurturing you know, the conversation with our communities. This is all I think. And uh, there are things that you can manage and things that you have to let the time go, you know. Um, I think this is also very Italian, you know. Uh, we, don't, we don't feel always this tension of delivery uh, in time, you know. Uh, we, better, we, better, we better think that is, is, is the meaningfulness, you know, things that then size the success of, of your project. And uh, this also happened by time, you know. Maybe the Colosseum uh, was not perceived as it is uh, now, uh, 2,000 years ago. So again, time is then giving uh, the sense and the signs of, of what you're doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, thank you so much again, seriously, for being here, especially because it really reminds me when I first um, got like connected with Golden Goose. Um, I became a Golden Goose lover late in, in my, <laughs> in, in high school. And it was really what you were talking about, about the emotional connection and the experience. Uh, I was always looking around and seeing in retail, in big retail stores. And I was like, not really attracted. And then I, it opened in Porto di Marmi and I saw the store and they were customizing the, the shoes outside. And it was all open and you could see everything inside. And I, and I went inside and I was looking and they were all different shoes, all different. And the, the guy was helping me out. He was saying, and I had my mom with me and he was telling me, no, you, you need to choose. You don't have to ask for anyone else because at the end of the day, you are the one who is going to wear those shoes. And, and what really, like why I love my pair of shoes, for example, is because it really defines who I am. I think it, I can express myself through my shoes which is something that with a lot of other shoes, I, I, I love sneakers, but um, with a lot of other sneakers, I, I, don't, I cannot do that. And, but at the end of the day, I think also this has an, an Italian component in this. So I wanted to know what does the Made in Italy component in the brand means to you? Like, I'm really touched by what you said, <laughs> really, because it's exactly <laughs> what we hope every day should happen to every person is uh, uh, approaching our brand is exactly what you were saying. And uh, what, is, what is the Made in Italy touch in there is uh, the combination of the things that you just mentioned, you know, and I was saying before, 
So uh, there is this instinct part of, of, the, of the purchasing process that is really passing through the, the browsing, the searching, you know. So it, it, sound, it sounds, you know, uh, superficial, but it's not, you know. When you go, try to think Bottega Veneta, Gucci, Prada, I mean, everything is already done for you. It's already cooked. You go there, in the advertising there was that shoe, so you must buy the shoe, otherwise you're not cool enough, and blah, blah. When you come to Golden Goose, we don't tell you anything, you know. There could be a pair of Superstar, there could be a pair of Slide, a pair of V-Star, a pair of Mid-Star, whatever. But every one of them synthesize a person behind, you know. And we let you choose. And what's nice is that you were asking me about Superstar. Usually it's, it has been always the shape, the, the starting shape for mo majority of our customers, you know. But then if you ask me customers that are owning 20, 40, 50 pairs of golden goods, now they have all the silhouettes, you know. So, and, and it's interesting, why? Uh, because technically, you know, Superstar, uh, we call um, Jergo Technico, is a tennis, you know. And if you remember, uh, I mean, by the time that shoe and sneakers get out of the sport to go into the real life, it was under the tennis time. You know, in fact, Stan Smith is still uh, the, the, the most sold silhouette uh, uh, of all history, okay? And uh, going then to your point is, uh, then you don't have to underestimate uh, um, the, 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 the hard connection, okay, that you make then with your product. When? By using it. So all this, the made in Italy uh, element is, uh, ha, but you need to find the right materials. Because you know, the shoe basically become then the, the white canvas where to write your story. That's why then when you have 20 or 40 pairs of these sneakers you know, in your closet, you remember exactly where you purchased them, as you said, who was behind your purchase, and what you've done with that shoe, you know. And this is exactly what probably 99% of the tourists that comes to our country always bring with them when they go back home. Because Colosseum is Colosseum. But every one of us probably would exper have experience, you know, there are only the experience near Colosseum, you know, or having a dish of pasta. So Italy is a little bit our sneaker, you know. It's something that apparently looks the same for everyone, by simply by leaving it and enjoying it, and then it becomes yours. And that's why we tend to say always this nice sentence, Golden Goose is about your story that then becomes our story. Thank you so much. Yes. This will also be our last question. Bonjour again, Silvio. Bonjour. Um, first of all, thank you so much for today. And um, it might be a bit of a long shot of a question because it's about the future. But I was just curious, because recently a lot of brands, luxury brands that you've mentioned, such as Gucci and Prada, um, but also sneaker brands such as Nike, Adidas, have entered the metaverse and proudly displayed it on their websites, um, in their fashion shows, etc. So I wanted to know what's your vision uh, and your take on NFTs and the metaverse for a brand like Golden Goose? It's an absolutely great question, and uh, I'm very honest to tell you that uh, uh, the only position I have is uh, I'm very curious about and uh, I'm really super excited about but I'm still in the mood of listening you know so I cannot take um, any position I think there are moments uh, where you can come up with uh, centers or outcomes and moments where you have to listen and uh, make sure to be always in the right place to listen from the best people. So if you ask me if Golden Goose uh, will, will approach uh, to Metaverse and to NFT and Untangible in general, absolutely yes, because again, we are consumer driven, so 100%. But if you ask me if now there's clarity in there, absolutely not, because if I make this question to you, you will probably answer my same, my same, my same way. You know? And, and that's why, you know, there are moments to act and moments for listen. So we are now in a moment to, to listen. And uh, carefully, very carefully, because uh, we really think it's going to be huge. There's a huge opportunity in there. 
And um, so I think, I think your question is also probably uh, answering to your point before. So as a suggestion to all this crew, probably you should, you should, you should look for uh, the future, the future opportunities uh, really into that world. I, I remember, I remind you that for you is metaverse, for me it was social. In 2000, there was, there was a small world. There was, there was a, uh, uh, qualcosa life, come si chiamava? Che era tipo, I don't remember, there were like 15, 15 different socials, you know. And then this Facebook came up, you know, and then. So probably, you know, uh, what, what's interesting to me is really how brave he was even uh, Mark in, uh, in uh, focusing so much into Meta. Uh, because it's true that he has already a lot, of, a lot of followers, but maybe the question is, are they the right followers for this project, for example, if I may? So but I, really, I really admire him because he was completely obsessed and uh, into it. Uh, but on the other side, I, I'm always a little bit skeptical on, on, on moving the first in such a deep way, you know. Uh, but, you know, these are innovators. That's why then they are the best in the world, you know. Uh, or they lose everything or they win everything, you know. So uh, I'm Italian on this. I tend to wait. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Silvio, Brandi, and Andrew, for the session. It was a true honor and pleasure to have you. And thank you all for coming, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Grazie.